When you think about it, there are lots of rules all around us that tell us what we can and can't do. Like this do not enter sign. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these around your town centre. It tells you not to enter a certain road. There are a lot of rules which are there for our own benefit, like this one. It tells you not to press the button, Timmy. I was just thinking, isn't it strange how some Tim rules are just crying Timmy, out to be broken? Read the sign, Timmy. I wouldn't press it if I were you. Timmy. I'm not you. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have done that. Rules can help us live together properly. But the rules have to be right, and we have to follow them. This game of drafts might look ordinary at first, but watch closely and you'll see that it's got all the rules wrong. The white pieces are on the white squares and the black on the black squares, and the game becomes totally useless. You can. Well, you can if you don't the do first, it. The first is the last and forget the No, I'll leave it. Too many crowns. Yeah, and you at least you can't get any more. <laughs> Person Ed. <laughs> Not as good as the old game. Because you can never you can't take and so it, it, it just gets boring and you just wanna pick them, pick pieces up and throw them. Just I thought so it was boring. boring as well because if you can't take then you're in to win really. So I didn't really like it. Everybody has a mind. <coughs> to be able to think for themselves. <coughs> Everybody has a body, and they can use their mind to make parts of their body do things. <coughs> When people are free enough to think for themselves, they can be faced with choices. Question, will a person always choose to go the right way? you've got more freedom, there's more fun. But after, when you get punished, you think, oh, why wasn't I good? They don't think you're going to get told off for it, because you're having fun while you're doing it. Yeah, definitely better to be good, because you're not getting in trouble or anything. Some people... And you can still have fun without getting, being naughty. You, sh you shouldn't be bad all the time, but it's, you should be bad some of the time, because your life is boring if you're not bad. Here's a question. Why do some people choose to do all the wrong things when they shouldn't? And why did Jules break all the rules? We went on a coach, a coach trip to the seaside. We went to see ships at harbour in the high tide. And uh, they went with a school and School trips all have some rules. Now, here are the rules for the day, which you must obey at all times. You are not to go wandering off on your own. You are not to lag behind me. And you are not to be tempted to go into any of the souvenir shops. 
Now, I hope you have all remembered to bring your pounds with you, because you will need them at the end of the day. In the class was a boy, and though his name was Julian, well, he called himself Jules because he broke all the main rules. He loitered behind the kids who'd come with his school. Well, I don't like this trip. To see another ship, I wish I were a gull. Then life would not be dull. Because it seems to me that seagulls can be free. They don't have rules, they don't have schools, they don't get Julesy school rule blueses. Now, I wouldn't be too sure about that, Julesy boy. I mean, we have rules in our sort of way which we have to obey, you know. Now, look behind you and listen to your old teacher, because I think he's got something to tell you. Now, have you remembered your pounds? Yes! Now, when we've been on our trip round here, we will come back to this lifeboat box and you can put them inside it. They needed a pound for giving later on, but Jules had got four pounds and not just one. That meant he got three pounds left for spending on something which he felt could be fun. But what on earth could it be? They didn't look much like fun round here, let's face it. Only boats and ships. Then there was a place which looked more like the pace. Some video games and more meant lots of fun in store. So Jules just slipped inside and opened his eyes wide. Here the fun was really on and he'd won and he hadn't noticed he'd gone. He spent all his pounds, except one for the lifeboat, then slipped back in line and looked like he'd be just fine. At the end of the trip, they stopped there in the sunshine by the side of a box which had a picture of a lifeboat on, you, you know the sort. To put in their pound. Oh, the lifeboat box. Now, remember your pounds? Okay, you can put them in the lifeboat box. Now, because it's been a hot day and you've been very, very good and you've obeyed all the rules, I'm going to let you do something that I've never let you do before when you've been in your uniform. After you put your money in the box, I'm going to let you spend any other money that you have on you. You can go and buy an ice cream. Ah, well, now Jules had something of a problem. He still had a pound left, which he'd kept very carefully and hadn't spent in all the amusements. Should he put it in the lifeboat box? Or should he buy that ice cream, which is lovely and cool? Go on, Jules, you've done lots of naughty things today. Put your money in the box and show you can do at least one thing that's right and good. No, he'll buy the ice cream. Remember who he is. He's Jules. And he breaks all the rules. Here's your ice cream. So what did he do? He was supposed to put the money in there, but once the um, teacher said, you've been very good, you can have an ice cream, he had an ice cream has been um, very good, so he does the opposite of what the teacher says and puts the money in the box. I think he bought the ice cream and just said to the teachers he dropped it and lost it. I think he would have put the money in the box because, um... He'd saved it all that time, even going into the arcades where he could have spent it, so he might as well put it in. Here's a real-life EQDA. On all our roads, there's one particular law or rule which is there to protect everybody, and that's the speed limit. Yet a lot of people break that law. Why? On roads like this, you're not allowed to go more than 70 miles per hour. And if you do, you might just meet my friend, Sergeant Aspinall. I can, uh, I can see through my mirror that there is a vehicle behind that's uh, approaching us rather fast and uh, forming the opinion that that one in particular, the black one, is breaking the speed limit. Sergeant Aspinall drives a special police car. What I'm going to do as soon as he comes past is I'm going to catch him on the film and I'm also going to check his speed by use of the computer to confront him with the vast car. This car has some of the latest equipment, including a television camera, so that cars which break the law can be put on video. There's a car that seems to be speeding now. As you can see, his speed's come up at 93.43 miles an hour. It's our intention now to pull him over and point the offence out to him. 
PC James operates the strobe lights on the front of the car, and he obviously has seen us. I've got to pull him over now and speak to him because he's broke the law. He's committed an offence. When people who break the speed limit spot a police car, they know they might get into trouble. But the car we were in isn't marked, and from the outside it looks just like any ordinary one. I spent a whole morning driving in it, and it was amazing that there seems to be a lot of drivers on the road who try to break the speed laws. Once we got back to police HQ, I chatted to Sergeant Aspinall about why people don't always seem to do what they know is the right thing. Some people genuinely don't know that uh, they commit an offence, they don't know the speed limit for the particular class of vehicle. Other people just lose concentration and just slip over the limit without even knowing it. Other people are purely impatient and selfish and they want to get on regardless. And some people do it merely because they want to get away with it, they conceive they can get away with it. Right, so um, what happens to them when you catch up with them? Well, we stop them and uh, we book them, we give them a fixed penalty ticket or uh, we g uh, give them a summons and go to court. So what would happen if we didn't have a speed limit law? People would just do whatever they liked. It keeps me and you alive. Now here's an EQDA, an easy question, difficult answer. How can we carry on doing what's right? Is it something that comes naturally? Or can we be helped? Here's a story where there's more than one lot of rules. Whose rules was Upman following? It's an old Muslim story based on a famine in Medina squillions of years ago. It was a famine. The crops had long since been eaten and nothing would grow in the cracked soil of Medina, the city so loved by the Prophet Muhammad, the first home of the Muslim community. Before the famine, Medina had been an oasis in the desert, a fresh and vibrant spot in a stretch of scorching sand as far as the eye could see. Now the shops were shut and the merchants long gone. There was no food left. The people were starving. They needed food. From beneath the canopy on the flat roof of her home, Layla's eye caught something tiny shimmering on the horizon. She leapt up in excitement, pointing and shrieking, look! Making its way over the sand dunes was a heavily laden caravan of Utman, the third caliph, a rich and well-respected businessman who had been on a shopping expedition. Some of the people ran out through the gates and over the burning hot sand to meet Utman. What did you get, they clamoured to know, tugging at his captain and almost pulling him off his camel. I'll take the lot. Here's some cash, pressed one of the richest men in Medina. No way, replied Utman with a wave of the hand. I'll double that offer, shouted another. No chance. We'll pay you three times what it cost you, bid the sisters who dealt in spices. No, nope, sorry, said Utman. I can raise that to four, proclaimed a metalsmith. Nothing doing, I'm afraid, Utman insisted. I'll go up to six times what the load is worth, said the silk trader. By now, with crowds pressing all round, Utman had reached the archway into Medina and dismounted. Look! You can make me offers until the camels come home, but this food is not for sale, simply because it belongs to someone else who is paying me ten times what it's worth. Ten, they gasped. You heard. Now will you let me pass? There was a stunned silence. Whoever could that be? The only way to find out was to follow him into Medina, where he unloaded his camel bags onto the street. Allah is great, he called. Come and eat. And he handed out armfuls of food to the poor. Their sad faces changed into smiles of thankfulness and tears of joy. La 
Messiah. Cheat, shouted the wealthy mob behind him, with angry eyes and clenched fist. No one bought it for ten times more. You deserve to be. Allah is the someone, Uthman explained. Look at the difference it has made to these beloved people. Don't you remember what it says in our holy Quran? That if you do something good, Allah will reward you ten times over. I have not followed your laws of buying and selling. I have followed those of Allah. The Jewish faith helps its followers understand what's right and wrong by teaching about the Torah. So how does Jonathan go about learning it? My name is Jonathan Kaplan. My family and I are Jews. Every week we celebrate the Sabbath, which is a very special day of rest, so plenty of work is done to prepare for it beforehand. I often help my mother with shopping for our Sabbath meal. They're taught that because God is good, we should try to be good as well and keep his commandments. Part of being Jewish is learning about our religion. So I go to two schools, my ordinary daytime school and a Hebrew religious school at our synagogue in the evenings and on Sundays. When the people were listening to Hashem giving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, I learn about Jewish laws and customs which are very important as to how we should live our lives. Shamor and Zachor. We remind ourselves with the two candles, keeping and remembering the Sabbath from three and a half thousand years ago to today and on into the future. Amen. My father, my brother and I go to the synagogue and after our return we have our special Sabbath meal. My father blesses the wine and the two special loaves called chalot. It is a time for the family to come together and discuss the happenings of the week. Cooking, lighting the gas or switching on electricity is forbidden on the Sabbath. We have rules about what we can eat. Permitted foods such as lamb, beef and chicken are called kosher when they have been properly prepared. We are forbidden to eat certain types of food, including pork and shellfish. We end the meal with a thanksgiving and we sing our Sabbath songs. We try to remember God in everything we do. Thanks, Jonathan. That was really interesting. Now, Timmy, do you remember all the questions we've asked today? Go on, remind me. Well, would you rather be bad or good? Me? <laughs> Who breaks the rules? And what would happen if we didn't have any rules or the law? Hmm. OK, would you rather buy an ice cream or give your money to charity? And what's the most important question is, what happens when the crisps run out? Ah! More questions next time.